I want to tell you tonight, my God's a chain breaker. I know what the world says about him, but let me tell you what the word says about him. The word says that nothing is impossible to him that believes. I know what the world says about him, but let me tell you what the word says about him. His name is Jehovah Jireh, cause he's a provider. His name is Jehovah Rapha, cause he's a healer. His name is Jehovah Sikanu, cause he's my righteousness. His name is Jehovah Mekadesh, cause he's my sanctifier and my deliverer. His name is Jehovah Nisi, cause he's a captain of the host. He's a God who's never lost a battle. Somebody ought to praise him in this room like he's the God that he says that he is. Whatever you need tonight, whatever you need tonight, there's enough faith in this room to give you your miracle. I want you to realize something tonight. He made you a promise. He made you a promise. Not a preacher. He made you a promise. If you ask anything in my name, I'll hear you and you have the petitions of you ask me for. How many in here need God to do something tonight? Well, let me teach, let me teach you something before the man of God comes. Praise is not just a sound. Praise has a sound, but it's not just a sound. It's something deeper. Praise is the release of spirit to spirit. Praise is not the appetizer to the meal. Because there's coming a day when there'll never be another need for another preacher to preach another sermon. But there'll never be a day in eternity when there'll never be a need for the righteous to gather around the throne room of God and give our God the praise that he's worthy of. Amen? So praise is not the appetizer. It's the release of something deep in you toward the God of the universe. And the Bible says if you do it, you build a seat. And then he makes you another promise. He inhabits the praises of his people. So here's what we're going to do for just a moment. We're not going to lift these instruments because sometimes what we do is the music gets in the way and the song lyrics get in the way. God loves all of this. God loves these instruments. Psalm 150 tells you that. He loves them all. But there's one thing he loves more than anything else. When they've done their best to tap in to God, there's one thing that'll move every mountain. There's one thing that'll cancel every attack of the enemy. Here it is. Let everything. Come on. I said let everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. I dare you for the next 60 seconds, throw your hands up in the air, open your mouth, and just let praise roll out of your innermost Come on, turn that heavenly prayer language loose. Come on, that's it. Just for 30 more seconds, turn that heavenly prayer language loose. Come on, something's falling off of you right now. Weariness is coming off of you right now. Depression is coming off you right now. Strength is coming on you now. Strength is coming on you now. Strength is coming on you now. If you're here for the first time at the bend, let me just make it clear. We're not ashamed of the God that we serve. We're radical because we got a radical God. Somebody said, Pastor, I don't understand all that stuff. Well, who in the world wants to worship a God that you can 
comprehend. I don't understand a lot of it either. But I know he's God. And here at the Bend, we believe two things. Number one, he's exactly who he says he is. And number two, he can still do everything that his word says that he can do. We are not cessationists. We're continuationists. We believe that God is still in the miracle working business. And I've got news for you tonight. God's here right now to do a miracle for you. Amen? Here's what we're going to do. I'm getting ready to turn the man of God loose. But I want you to take about a minute, and I want you just to find some people around you, hug somebody's neck, shake somebody's hand. Come on, move around all over this building for just a moment. You've got just a minute to love on somebody, and then we're going to turn the man of God loose. Amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. You can be seated. So glad you guys are here tonight in the house. Is anybody expecting? That was weak. I said, is anybody expecting? Amen. Well, last night we started it off with a bang. Dr. Rod Parsley, my pastor, came in and tore the house up. Whenever we got here and he saw the pews, uh, one of his guys said, you know what pastor's going to do tonight, don't you? And I said, what's that? He said, he's going to walk these pews. I said, no way. He's 66 years old. Last night when he jumped up on that front pew, I said, 66 or not, he can still walk those pews and preach. And did such an amazing job. Let me give you a victory report. Last night, 46 people gave their lives to Christ. Over 50 in the altar and 46 people gave their lives to Christ. Amen. We learned last night they didn't make a decision. They got converted. They got snatched out of the kingdom of darkness and put in the kingdom of God's dear son. Amen. What a wonderful thing that is. Tonight, I am so honored and blessed to have one of America's greatest voices. I, I truly uh, believe this. I sent out a text today and uh, I said... I, uh, I want you to know tonight who's coming to be in the house with you is considered to be one of the greatest revivalist preachers alive today on the planet. Bishop Kevin Wallace has been known for decades as a great leader uh, in a very powerful denomination. I graduated Lee, uh, and so uh, we are from, cut from that same cloth of the Church of God and has had an amazing work that's going on in the Chattanooga region, that whole region, just shaking it, now planting campuses all over the place. Every time I see, he's springing up another one. God is using him mightily. Whenever uh, Pastor Parsley agreed to come, one of the things I did is the first person I reached out to is I, I just, I said, Lord, I want, I want you to do something for our people. We've been in four buildings in four years and we, we don't even have a home. We, uh, we're homeless. I think God's trying to teach us how to build a church without having a building. And I think it's more important to learn how to be the church than it is to go to church. And so God's teaching us that, and I'm open to that. And uh, I, called, uh, I called Bishop Wallace, and I said, hey, uh, I texted him. I said, hey, I, I've got Dr. Parsley coming on a Wednesday night. I really feel like put God put it in my heart to ask you if you would uh, come and bless our people, bless our region on a Thursday night. He immediately texted me back and said, I would be honored to, uh, to come and be a part. And Bishop Wallace, I know that you could be a thousand places tonight in a lot larger venues. And uh, he even went to one of the old locations today, got lost, went to a lo old location. He said, where's the other place? I said, well, it's Cookville Free Will Baptist. You'll know it when you get there. 
And so I told him, I said, uh, I said, the leaders of, of the church are here tonight. They're sitting right back there, Bishop Wallace. And so thank God for the leadership here at Cookville Free Will Baptist. We love you guys very much for partnering with us. Tonight, I want you to do something. One more time, would you stand on your feet all over this room? I want us to give God the honor that he deserves for bringing such a great voice to us. And I want you to give Bishop Kevin Wallace the greatest Upper Cumberland, Tennessee welcome that he has ever had in his life. Come on, let's do what the psalmist said. Clap and shout, all ye people. Clap and shout. Don't just clap, don't just shout. Clap and shout, all ye people. And if you're going to do it, do it with the voice of triumph. Come on, give God praise. I found it to be good when I feel like praising him, but it works when I don't feel like praising him. Somebody give him a praise in the church. Wow. A Pentecostal in a free will Baptist. And we're going to have a move and already been in a move and in God good. I'm honored to be here tonight. I have followed your pastor for a number of years. His track record in the kingdom of leadership and developing not just you know, it's one thing to build a church. It's another thing to build a culture. Talk to me, somebody. We got a lot of people who know how to have good church, but I found out building a culture takes some sacrifices, some warfare. People talk about you, lie on you, you got some scars. But at the end of the day, the devil is a liar. Jesus is alive. And uh, what God's got you in right now is a season of preparation. Look at your neighbor, tell him, I'm in an incubator. Yeah. What is this building we're in? It's an incubator. You better not get used to buildings because I'm telling you, you might be building something till Jesus comes. What God is doing is supernatural in this place. It was a season in our life we were laying brick for 12 straight years. I don't want to go back there, but I'm thankful for that season. I want you to go with me tonight to the book of Hebrews. Pastor Shane, I'm honored to be here, sir, and thank you. Just stay standing. We're going to sit. I'm going to, I promise you, you're going to sit. I know you, you worked all week long. I'm going to let you sit if you stand in a minute because you feel something in your feet. Hallelujah. Good to see you, dear friend. Pastor Greg, love you, sir. Honored to be with you tonight. Ben, I want to tell you that... Jesus is coming. Playing church is not an option. Souls are dying and going to hell. Nobody cares about the color of the walls, the carpet, or the... They just want more of him. How many want more of Jesus tonight? I want you to turn chapter. I'm going to preach something that the Lord touched my... Sp I, I promise you I was preaching another message and I uh, I got out in the yard and was doing some yard work got a flat tire and on the lawnmower today y'all don't care about that I was changing that flat tire and the Lord started speaking to me and I quit changing the flat tire and started walking around praying in the Holy Ghost and I felt like the Lord took me to this tonight and I want to go to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23 look at your neighbor say neighbor you look better tonight than you did on Easter. Come on. How many have the joy of the Holy Ghost? Say amen. Something's happening. Something wonderful is happening. Something powerful is happening. Jesus, it's happening, something's happening. Listen, something more for us is happening. Something glorious is happening. Jesus, 
Why am I singing this? Because the news wants you to believe the devil's got the win and he's leading, but the scoreboard says something's happening. Something wonderful is happening. Shake your neighbor's hand, tell them something powerful is happening. Jesus, revival's happening. Woo! Something's happening. Something glorious is happening. Something more for us is happening. Jesus. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Somebody throw your hands up and say, Revive us. Somebody put it in the atmosphere. Revive us. How many need it tonight? Revive us again. I need you to put it on high. The Bible calls up one kind of praise a high praise. Everybody can praise right here, but I need somebody to get it right here and say, Revive us! How many need heaven to revive you tonight? Revive us! Revive us again. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. I need to notify Cookville, the best is yet to come. Hey! Glory! Well, you don't know what I was raised in. I have no clue. But you were not raised in the kind of fire that's on the way. The best is yet to come. Woo! Revive us. Again, Hebrews 10, verse 19. My subject tonight, let us do this. Let us do this. I'm a neighbor preacher. Look at your neighbor and say, we got something to do. If your neighbor looks hateful, grab your stuff, get your purse, your wig, your, your tube, whatever. Take it and find somebody who looks happy. Tell your neighbor one more time. Say, let us do this. We've got something to do here. Let's go. Verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, mm. and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water verse 23 let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us consider one another and in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Three times in five verses, the writer of the epistle of Hebrews says, let us do this. And I'm thankful in a world of chaos and confusion for the clarity that God makes very real and known to us in his word. And over the years I have grown to appreciate when God makes something crystal clear. How many know if God said it, the agnostic and the atheist and the doubter can disagree with it, but God is true and every man be a liar. Somebody say amen. So tonight I want to talk about what we ought to do. I know there's a lot of stuff we can talk about what not to do, but tonight this is what we're going to do. Because this is what the Bible says, let us be found doing. Pray for me and I'll pray for you, Father. Help us tonight. I pray, God, that the atmosphere 
would just be broken open that the truth of God would permeate every heart like a sword. Lord, thank you for dividing between soul and sunder, joints and marrow, and the word is a discerner and a thought of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. And I pray tonight that the word of God would even read my mail while I preach it. Read all of our mail. We need our mail read. We need our hearts, Lord God, to be transformed and not conformed to this world. So help us. We humble ourselves before you and we confess our need for you. Bless the people of God in Jesus' name and everyone said amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Tonight our subject is found in the book of Hebrews. Some would call it a complicated book in the Bible and to be quite honest with you, there are challenges in understanding some of the depth and the revelation that is in Hebrews, but I am thankful that the Spirit of God doesn't make a mistake and he wrote the book of Hebrews. There is such profound revelation in the book of Hebrews and much of it, much of it centers around the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Tonight I want to remind you that no matter how complex this world becomes and no matter how complex the culture is in which we live, there are some things that the church must never ever decide she's going to shift or change on. And one of them is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm not looking for another Messiah. I'm not searching for another lamb. We are not waiting on uh, someone to come and rescue us. We've been born again and saved, and no matter what is going on in the world around us, Jesus Christ is who he says he is. He is who the Bible says he is. And I want you to know he is not one among many. He is unlike any other. He is one of a kind. You can't put him on your chimney mantle. You can't walk by him in your living room and say, hey, how are you? He is not a God who has eyes but cannot see and a hand that cannot touch and ears that cannot hear and a mouth that cannot speak. He is not like the idols of this world. There is nobody like Jesus. I want to tell you that's why when we come to church and we begin to praise him, praise is comely. The Bible said in the book of Psalm, praise is comely for the upright. Praise is where God is known according to Psalm 67. It said he is known in Judah. I feel like the world is looking for the answer and we've got it and we've got to start telling the good news that Jesus Christ is the Lord. You say we need more than that. That's where we get into error. The problem is not we need something new. The problem is we have allowed what is accurate and real and authoritative to become old and rusty. The revelation, however, is still the revelation. Uh, what am I saying? I'm, let me break it down like this. My mama is a master cook. She makes fried chicken that would make your tongue come out of your mouth and slap you on the side of the face. It's that kind of good. When my mama's fried chicken comes hot off the skillet, it'll set the captive free. But you give it two days and put it in the refrigerator and that fried chicken gets cold and solidifies, it's not good anymore. It's not that she needs a new recipe. It's that we need a fresh batch of what's always been good. And what I want to tell the church is the reason that some people are going to other recipes is because we haven't prayed and touched the heart of the one who stared death in the face, overcame the grave, and made a spectacle out of the devil. He's still Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. There's still nobody like him, church. He's still the everlasting one. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. There is nobody like Jesus. So I say preach him a little loud. Sing a little louder. Shout a little louder. Let God arise and every enemy be scattered. Somebody say amen. amen. Hebrews is all about Jesus. The writer of Hebrews would tell us that he is better than Moses. He is better than the angels. In fact, there's no one greater than Jesus. And by the time we get here to the chap, can I preach like I feel it tonight? By the time we get to the 10th chapter of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, who I believe is Paul, but if you disagree, we're still going to heaven together. 
The writer of Hebrews is telling us that this man, Jesus, he was the presenter and he was the very sacrifice. See, in the old covenant, you had a high priest who brought the offering to God. I could take you to Exodus and show you that the high priest had to put on the holy garb so that he could come into the holy place and bring a spotless lamb and the blood of that lamb into the holy place, put that blood on the mercy seat. And when the blood touched the mercy seat for one year, the sins of the nation were a pe- the, the wrath of God was appeased by the blood of that lamb. You had a priest and you had an offering. He, I don't have time to preach the depth of the priesthood and the work of Jesus as priest, but suffice it to say that when Jesus came in the new covenant, nobody brought him into the holy place. The Bible said he brought himself. Lord, I feel like preaching. That's why he looked at his disciples and said nobody takes my life I'm the one that's going to walk into the holy place and I'm going to lay it down and if I lay my life down on that holy place I've got the power to raise it back up again he walked in and said I'm bringing the sacrifice heaven said where is the sacrifice and Jesus said I am the sacrifice I'm the one who condemns sin in the flesh can I preach it like I feel it tonight I'm the one that stared flesh right in the eye and said I'm still God in the flesh you can tell me that I'm just Mary's son oh my that is sad however I'm the Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end there's nobody like Jesus by the time we get to the 10th chapter of Hebrews he has already articulated and enunciated the sacrifice and the bringing forth of the sacrifice into the holy place oh I don't have time to go into it deeply but I'm thankful tonight that Jesus went in and he put his blood in a place that settled the sin debt for humanity once and for all. That's why I come to tell somebody tonight, get off the treadmill trying to make yourself holy and start shouting that he walked up a hill and bore a cross on a, on a hillside called Calvary so that you could be holy. Righteousness is not what you earn. Righteousness is what he made you by going into the holy place and putting his blood on the mercy seat. And I think we need to take a praise break right now that he who knew no sin sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Somebody give him praise. But I I didn't come to preach on that. This is just an introduction here. I can tell you this, that because that lamb spilled his blood and went into the holy place and the presenter who was Christ brought the offering who was Christ into the holy place. I know that don't make sense, but you'll catch it on the way home. And when he went in, he put his own blood on the mercy seat, not so that you and I could shout about what he did for himself, but he did it so that a whole family could follow him into the presence of God. In fact, if there was any doubt that God wants you to be people of his presence, he even took away the veil. Can I preach it like I feel like preaching it tonight? He didn't leave a veil that you have to go behind. In fact, there are no courts. I'm sick and tired of religiosity making outer courts and inner courts. I want to tell you there is no court system in the redeemed. The redeemed have, oh, I feel him right then. Thank you. Lord, thank you that I have access 24 hours a day. I have access seven days a week. I don't have to find the outer court. He tore the veil when they tore his flesh so that you and I can come boldly 
come to the throne of grace and find help when we're in a time of need. Cancer is getting ready to leave somebody's body. Tumors are getting ready to shrink. God said you don't have to earn your way in. Come boldly because my blood says you're able. Come boldly because my blood says you're forgiven. If you know you are, open up your mouth and give him praise. Having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Did you hear what he said? If you want into the presence, you got to go through the veil. But the veil... It's not the veil of the old covenant. If you go through the flesh of Jesus, he said, I tore the curtain. I wish I had some help in cooking. Do you understand that the old covenant veil was a very thick veil? And it kept people that were not supposed to be in from coming into the presence of the Lord. But when Jesus died on the outskirts of Jerusalem, the Bible said that the earth rent and the sky grew dark and that the veil of the temple was not torn from the bottom to the top because if it was torn from the bottom to the top it meant that man got a hold of it but the fact that it was rent from top to bottom indicates that man didn't take care of it man had to stand by and say surely this is the son of God and God took his hands one hand called justice one hand called mercy Jesus in the middle and he rent the veil from top to bottom and now all who come through Christ come into a new and a living way somebody shout in this that's not what I came to preach so having been covered by the blood and coming into a new and living way which he consecrated when we came through his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God let us let us look at your neighbor elbow him karate chop him wake him up today let us let us let us let us let us ready here we go number one let us draw near I don't know about all this Holy Spirit Christianity Jesus power miracle I don't know I just want to be saved enough to go to heaven but I don't know about all this fire talk let us draw near This works better the closer you get to him. Well, I don't want him to talk about me. Can I help you? They already are. Well, I want a God that's understandable. I, I don't quite know what to do with my friend circle. They get nervous when I start talking about God speaking to me. You need a new friend circle. I'm not telling you to get rid of those friends. Just get some friends that know what it means when you feel something and you say, the Lord's dealing with me and they don't look at you funny. There used to be a deodorant commercial growing up. Get a little closer. Remember that? I think the problem with some things going on in the church, not all, but the problem with some of us is we want to say we know God, but we don't want to get close to God. I'm reminded of what the young lady said in the Chronicles of Narnia. Narnia. She said, is Aslan safe? 
And he responded, no, but he's good. And I think sometimes we want a God who makes us feel comfortable in our Christianity. But he is far too powerful to be micromized into our little package that makes him presentable and understandable. Gnosticism is alive and well in the modern church. We want a God that we can reduce and humanize. And now the whole thing is let's just preach him in such a fashion and in such a way he's like us. Oh no, when Jesus showed up in the temple preaching, it freaked the people out. They looked at each other and said, we've never heard a man preach like this. We've never seen miracles like this man is doing. In fact, there were times he confounded the wise and he didn't even stop to give an explanation. He simply let them walk home in their stupor to process what they had seen because their religious Phariseeism had never healed the blind. All Jesus did is spoke a word and blind eyes opened, deaf ears popped open, lame legs started walking, and they say, wait a minute, he didn't follow our temptation. He didn't follow our protocol. And what I came to tell you is God does not need our churchy protocol. What God wants is somebody who is desperate for his touch and will draw near to him. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from, I'm just going to teach tonight, is that okay? And our bodies washed with pure water. I still believe in holiness unto the Lord. It's not legalism. It's not a burden. It's not a chore. It's my delight to be free from a life of sin that used to be my slave master and to walk in the freedom. See, this is the problem. We preach this stuff and then they say things like, he's a legalist. And the reason we think that's legalism is because we were not taught sin is not our friend, it was actually our enemy. And we are looking for a doctrine that makes it palatable to continue. I'm, I don't know. This was not in my notes. Take it if you need it. Sin is not your friend. It won't help you in your future. It won't free your family. It won't help your children. In fact, sin is the most deceptive, corrosive, caustic, and damaging influence on this planet. It will keep you longer than you wanted to stay and make you pay more than it told you you would have to pay. Sin is an enemy, which is why Paul would say in the book of Romans that the wages of sin is death but I'm thankful that he put a comma and he didn't stop preaching but but the Bible said the gift of God is eternal life and tonight we're not dying even though we have a past because Christ lives we have a future and I wish somebody on every row would praise him for it my God we got a band so let us get close. Look at your neighbor say, get closer. It's not time to get further away. It ain't going to work out for you. I have, and Rick knows this, and I say this not to my glory or my glee. It broke my heart. I've wept. I've been on my knees. I've walked with men of God that I love and adore during COVID six times. In 14 months, people who lost everything. And the common thread of their defeat, through adultery, through lying, through alternate lifestyles, whatever they were dealing with, the common thread of defeat was this. I stopped talking to God. Draw near. I know it's old fashioned, but draw near. Well, prayer is tough. I'm not saying it's easy for me. There are sometimes, Pastor Shane, I have to go into my study. I don't feel it. There are no tingles. There are no goosebumps. There's no angelic host. I don't get revelation sometimes. My Bible, I read it. It feels like crackers in my mind. I'm just telling you my story. It feels dry. I don't feel breakthrough. What do you do? Do you surrender to the flesh and the oppression and the, and the resistance? No, you just say, Lord, I don't know how long I'm going to have to stay here. I don't know.
know what I've got to do to get out of this, but I know you're good, and I'm going to keep on drawing, and here's what I have found. He wants you more than you ever wanted his presence. He wants you, but what he doesn't want is somebody who wants him only when it is convenient, somebody who wants him when it's easy. The thing that God wants to do in your life is not cheap. It is precious. It is costly, and if you ever make the transaction of getting hungrier for God, then you are the things of this world. He will run to you. He will fall. He will let you get so close to him like the apostle John. You will feel his heartbeat as you lay his, your head on his breast. Draw near. Number two. We're almost done. Number two. Let, not quite though. Let us hold fast. Number one, let us draw near. Number two, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Now, if you have a King James Bible, it would say faith, but that's not the best translation. In fact, it's the only place and time in the entire scripture that Greek word, elpsis, is used and translated as faith. Every other time it is used in the New Testament, it is translated as hope, which is why the New King James translators use the word hope. And I find it fascinating. He didn't hear me what I'm about to help. I'm helping somebody right here. He did not say, hold fast to your feeling of hope. He said, let us hold fast to our confession. I'm getting ready to set myself free. Have you ever not felt hopeful, but you kept on confessing? I've got a feeling. Everything is going to be, I'm helping somebody in here tonight. Don't ever get confused between the feeling of hope and the confession of hope. Faith is not about how you feel. Just people don't live by what they feel, for the just shall live by faith. You're not looking at a preacher that wakes up every morning and angels visit him and his wife, carry me to my office, open my Bible and say, this is your word for the day. Oh no, you don't, you're not looking at a preacher. Are you walk in my house? Do you always walk around praying in tongues? Oh no. There are sometimes I walk around running my hair through my, my hands through my hair. God, where are you? God, how are you going to help me? I don't know why it's happening like this, but I decree and declare, I confess that I have a hopeful expectation about the situation I feel him in here right now that I'm dealing with. Some of you didn't come to church on Thursday night because you feel hopeful, but every Everybody in here tonight can continue to confess that he who made me a promise is faithful to finish what he started. Oh God, I wish you would shake your neighbor's hand. Tell a neighbor I don't know how you feel, but I dare you to confuse every devil and tell yourself I still trust in God. I still believe in his promise. Every promise in the book is hold fast to your confession of hope. Hope is not a feeling of, well, let's see what happens. He said, don't swerve. This is an interesting word. It's only used here in the entire New Testament. Don't swerve. Don't stumble. Romans 4 said this, Abraham staggered not at the promises of God with unbelief, but he made his mind up that he who promised was faithful. Anybody in here holding on to a promise? Do you know that the enemy's job is to get you and I to stop believing before the promise comes to pass? But here's what I have found about the promises of God. The promises of God last longer than the lies of the devil. <laughs> Oh, I'm not telling you the devil's not going to lie. I'm just telling you the promise is greater than the lie. 
What God said is so. What God said about your children that are not here tonight. You know what I just got a feeling? I got a feeling somebody's child's coming to church before we say the final amen. You wanted them to be here from the worship and the devil's been sitting on somebody's shoulder telling you what they didn't come. How do you like that? You need to shout and tell the devil to get out of your mind and get up under your feet. Your children are going to know God. Your children are going to teach Sunday school. Your children are going to talk in tongues. Your children are going to know the power of God. And the devil is going to wish he never messed with your house. Somebody give God a praise. If I'm talking to you, give God a shout. If you got a child who needs deliverance and you got a promise that it's going to happen, I dare you to take 15 seconds and tell the devil, notify hell, you will not have my babies. My babies will know the power. Okay. Please be seated. I got to stop this here. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Halfway done, verse 24, last half. Let us consider. Can you put that scripture up for me? Let us consider one another in order to stir up. Yeah, it's hard to say, ain't it? Love. This is where the Lord visited me today. The Lord said to me today, Kevin, we're getting hateful in the church. I I might not have been sent to say anything else, but the Lord helped me today. He said, Kevin, the church is getting hateful in the name of holiness. Y'all not gonna like this. I'm just going to read it like he gave it to me. Verse 12 of Matthew 24. Can I tell you what Jesus never said? Jesus never said, in the last days it will be marked by Jezebel. Is there a spirit of Jezebel loose? Oh, there's a spirit of Jezebel loose. We have to deal with them all the time. Deal with it all the time. Deal with it all the time because it's not a woman, it's a spirit. And y'all don't want this, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. It can wear a three-piece suit. It can wear a bishop's robe. It can wear a miniskirt. Jezebel is unprejudiced to the package it comes in. It's looking for anybody that wants to exalt itself above and beyond the name of Jesus. Jesus never said in the last day Jezebel will be running rampant. He said that's not how you'll know you're in the last day. What he said is in Matthew 24, verse 12, because iniquity shall abound. Do you know what the word iniquity is in the Greek? It's anomia. Ah, nomia. Nomia is law. Ah is a prefix that is the opposite. So what he's literally saying is because of lawlessness. I didn't get no help there. But because people are without regard for law, the love of many will wax cold. I heard the Holy Ghost say to me today, tell the church, and listen to me, when I preach, I'm not preaching to the house. I'm preaching to everybody watching online. I'm preaching to my own spirit. I'm preaching to everyone who will watch this down the road. We've got to, we've got to make sure we understand that when God starts speaking, he'll speak through whatever vehicle says yes and whatever door is open for that person. So when I'm saying this, this is not just at you, it's through you to whoever hears it. We need to hear this. This is what the Spirit of God said to me. He said, tell the church to stop partnering with a spirit of anger. Stop partnering with a spirit of frustration. Stop partnering with a spirit of bitterness. Our preaching is not to be done in some nasty response to the evil of our day. 
Our preaching is to be done to the glorification of the resurrected one who died on a cross, rose from the dead, is now seated at the right hand of God in ultimate victory and triumph. We cannot demonstrate a gospel that throws shade on the work of Jesus Christ. We cannot declare, decree, preach, and demonstrate a gospel that simply magnifies the stupidity of our generation more than it does the power of our risen Savior. Jesus did not say that we would know them by their preaching. He did not say we would know them by their miracles. He did not say we would know them by the tongues they speak in or their spiritual warfare. Jesus said, if you want to know who belongs to me, by this shall men know you are my disciples, that you have love one for the other. The ministry of Jesus was saturated with love, compassion, humility, forgiveness, and hope. And we often ignore these things. And we preach and point our finger. I do. And we talk about how he cleansed the temple. How he got mad. Let me tell you, that was one place in the gospel. And the people that he ran out were not those who were struggling. Not those who were confused. It was money-making Pharisees who had developed a scheme of religiosity that ignored the power of prayer and the hope that is found in God. smile through this yes Jesus got angry at religion so if you want to know what gets under the skin of Jesus and ruffles his feathers it was the religious who stood on the corner and stuck their chest out and said look at me I'm holy and as the Lord began to speak to me today I began to say Lord give me the heart of that publican who stood on the corner and dropped his head and beat his chest and said, I'm a sinner, Lord. Have mercy on me. You understand something, family? When Jesus comes in to clean the house, it's not to clean it for the people who are struggling and trying and doing their best. When he comes in to clean the house, it's to get rid of the red tape that religion has built around his presence and all of the Phariseeism that's alive and well in our churches today is not helping us reap the harvest that the Lord has called us to reap. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul said, I pray to God for you that your love would increase and abound. I'm going to stop preaching right here for just a moment. I want you to lay your hand on your neighbor's shoulder. And if you're watching online, I want you to lay hand on your spouse, whoever you're watching this with. I want us to pray one for another. I want us to pray like Paul prayed for the church at Thessalonica. Lord, let their love abound. Let their love increase. Let their heart get full of love. I thank you right now. You are removing hatefulness, frustration. You're taking it out of our hearts, Lord, because you've called us to be a people of love. You've called us to be a people of love. You've called us, you, you said that's how they'll know that you're my disciples. And tonight, God, we're tired of being known for our frustration. I am. I'm tired of being known for how hateful we are. God, turn us into a movement of love. The kind of love that honors you, that honors your word, that is free of compromise but full of hope for the sinner and those who are confused by the lie of our culture. May our houses of worship become places and sanctuaries of love where people who need the love of God can find it and not have to walk through the red tape of religion to get there. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. He said, he said, let us, watch this, provoke one another to love. Provoke. Only used one other time in the whole Bible. You know where it's used? Where the Bible said there was a strong contention between them, between the disciples. They got in a heated discussion about how to get saved. And that same word is used here. To provoke means to contend with one another. In other words, in love. Go to your brother or sister who's in a place 
where it just looks like they're super frustrated and hateful, say to them, you're better than that. Well, we don't like the Bible. That's okay. I do. I love it. Sometimes I need somebody to get in my face and say, that ain't the ticket, bro. Well, I want to make sure everybody knows I'm holy. You're creating an echo chamber and getting amens from people who feel like you and followers from people who are as mad as you are. Say amen. amen. I watched and everybody else in this room, I'm sure, over the last 42, 78, two hours, 48, 72 hours, situations going on in the kingdom right now that are making a mockery of the kingdom of God. It's nauseating. Somebody got to humble their self. Even if it means going in love and saying, I'm going to shut up for the sake of the kingdom. It's not my church, so I'm going to be careful here, but I, I want you to understand some family people are watching us. And if we say we have the gospel, the gospel is the good news, and where is it? The good news is, if you're broke, busted, and disgusted, you can find new life in Jesus. If you're condemned, if you feel guilty, if you feel hopeless, it's a lie. Jesus came to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. If you feel like you're living on death row and that your sin is so great that God could never forgive you, hey, 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 I've got good news on a Thursday night in Cookful where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. If your sin is great, his grace is greater. If you've got a past, it's all right. If you come to the cross, I'll show you you have a future. Somebody say, yeah. Through. Provoke one another to love. And provoke one another to good works. Look at your neighbor say, get busy. Well, I'm not saved by good works. You're not. Paul made it very clear in Ephesians 2. For by grace, you are saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, which is eternal life. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And we often pre preach that and quote that and stop there. But the next verse says, but you are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus, who for before the foundation of the word world he created so that you may accomplish good works. Come on. That's right. Wait, he just said, I'm not saved by works. And the next verse, he said, works. And the reason is this: you are not saved by works, you are saved for good works. You ready for this? Two-thirds of God's name is go. <laughs> Hooked on phonics work for me. Come on. He did not say sit ye. He said go ye. Ready for this? Everyone stand up real quick. We're almost through, but not quite. Turn around and put your hand on your seat. Turn around and put your hand on your seat. You feel that warm spot where you were sitting? That is not your contribution to the kingdom of God. Well, I'm here. Well, we're glad. Now, I need you to get a parking vest and help cars park. I need you to teach in the children's department. I need you to sing in the choir. I don't hear nobody talking to me. We need you to get activated. Get engaged. Don't be a consumer. You have received so great a salvation. If he poured it in, find a place in this house to pour it out. Look at somebody say, get to work. Get to work. Well, I'm just checking things out. Been here two years. You know what it's about. Get to work. It's like people who go to the swimming pool. Have you ever met those people who have no intention of getting in the water? They go for the furniture. Do 
Don't splash me. I'm tanning. Well, we're, we're over you tanning. We want to make a splash. We want to jump in the deep end of the pool. Where are the people who are not looking for the furniture? They're not looking for the shallow end. They're looking for the deep end. They're in it all the way. They're provoked to good works. I will not sit here and wait till Jesus comes and rescues me. I will find out something that will help my pastor. I will get involved in a way that will help my church advance the kingdom. Look at your neighbor, tell him, get to work. ready for this? Some of you dear brothers on Sunday morning, you already do it, but I'm calling on some more of you. You're going to have to give your seat up. You don't have to receive it. But what if they come in droves and they're coming? Do you understand they're coming, Ben? They're coming to you. What are you going to do when they get here? You can't say, well, that's my seat. You don't have a seat. This is his house and he's here for the lost. So just make, make room for the harvest. Come on, shake hands with somebody, hug somebody, tell them make room for the harvest. Get involved, get engaged, do something for the king of glory. Good works. Good works. Good works. And I'm I'm done with this. Here I go. I'm done. You survived. (laughs) And do not forsake the assembling of yourselves as some have done. Now that thing bothered me right there, Pastor Shane. Some have stopped assembling. Well, you know, I am, um, I am, I'm an introvert. Okay. Till the volunteers score a touchdown and then we shake our double wide and get the law called on us because we're not so introverted anymore here's what I have found out about you and I will invest in something that is important to us You ready for this? COVID is a lie. I'm not saying it wasn't real. I'm just saying it wasn't king. I had a, I I won't say who, I had a person in Chattanooga in government tell me, Kev, you have to respect the fact that right now in this place in our history, COVID is king. And when he said that, I can handle a lot of things, bro. We can talk about a lot of stuff, but you can't use that kind of word around me. Because I have no king but Jesus. Is he going to go there? I'm not going there. I already went there and we're past it. You ain't talking. I ain't talking about COVID in months because you know why COVID was a fad. It's gone. Jesus is still alive and the church is still on the move. COVID exposed. Anyone looking for a long-term excuse not to come back to the house of God. And I find it rather humiliating and embarrassing that there are still people who sit three miles down the road from our churches, never get out of their pajamas, drink their cappuccino and eat their toast while we're having church. Don't tithe. I'm I'm about to do a Rod Parsley in here. here. (laughs) Won't tithe. Won't give. Sit at home. Out of convenience. And while we're over here trying to beg people to get back in church, China's losing their life in the underground church under the threat of governmental death penalties and they're worshiping Jesus I tell you we need revival Julian help me I'm done and here's why 
because the day is approaching. I found out tonight, Squire Parson is your dad. Is that right? When I was 15 years old, two years of my life, I was raised in a Baptist church. My mom and dad got hurt in a church split. They didn't go to church for a couple of years, and I rode a Baptist bus. It's the only way I could get to church. I was raised in holiness my whole life. I'd go down to the end of the road and I'd catch that bus as a 15 year old kid and I would sit out there Greg Locke every Sunday for two years and hear Ray Stone Cipher preach on grace I sat there as a boy in my arrogance and pride and I said man I hadn't heard a good hole in this sermon in two years I went and seen him about it I set up an appointment with the Dr. Stone Cipher 15 years old I walked in his office I said do you ever preach holiness I lost my mind. He said, I preach holiness every Sunday. But you can't get holy yourself, Kevin. You need grace. And the Lord let me go to that. I'm going somewhere, I promise. The Lord let me go to that church for two years to help me have a deep appreciation, not for my works, but for his grace. The first song I ever sang in church growing up. You don't know this one, I don't think, but it says, Beulah Land. I'm longing for you. And someday. There my home shall be eternal. Yeah. Beulah land, <laughs> sweet Beulah land. kind of homesick it's a verse for that country to which I've never been before no sad goodbyes Will there be spoken? And time won't matter anymore. Whoa! I feel him in the room. Beulah land. I'm lost. And someday on thee I'll stand there my home shall be eternal. I'm looking out across the river. I didn't have this plan to where my faith shall end inside. Here, family, there's just a few more. 
Just a few more days to labor And I will take My heavenly flight How many are thankful for the promise of heaven tonight? Beulah land Glory I'm longing for you And someday Where my home shall be eternal. Sweet Beulah land. Listen. Look at your neighbor and hug them and tell them, go to church. Hey, you watching online three miles down the road, come to church. Make assembly significant to you. Last night, I believe the Lord saved so many beautiful people. And it would be easy for me to presume that everyone in this house is ready to meet Jesus. But the day is approaching. Jesus is coming soon. And I want to do two things before I take my seat. I want to give an altar call for people who feel the conviction power of God touching the knocking on the door of your heart. Just that little, let me in. It's about eyes are closed if you're in this room and you don't, you've heard about Jesus, but you don't really know him. Or maybe you've known him, but you feel a million miles away and it's been a long time since you've been walking with him. And tonight, whether you've known him or you've never known him, if you're in this room and you know you need him to save and rescue you, I don't care how long or what or how bad you feel about your life or what you've been doing wrong. If you are in this place, whether you are a millionaire feeling like you've got life by the tail or you are broke, busted, and disgusted, poor as a pauper's purse, broke, broke as a beggar's bank account. If you're in this room and you need Jesus to rescue you and save you, regardless of the drugs, regardless of the affairs, regardless of the lust, regardless of the lies, regardless of the past. Maybe there's just one who would say, I believe you preacher, I believe the day is approaching and I need Jesus to save me. If I'm talking to you, when I say three, lift your hand. One, two, three, right now. Bam. Yes, sir. God bless you. Yes, sir. God bless you. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Every one of you, put your hands down right now. Here, I don't know how you do it here, but I'll just, I'll do it like this where we come from. I want you, there's a person, keep playing that, Jewel, on your left and on your right. There's a person, you may have known them your whole life. You may have never met them before you walked in this building. You may want me to shut up because you know that your heart beating out of your chest. I feel like there's a man in here trying to get out of this service without getting born again, but you're about to you're about to sell out for Jesus for the rest of your life. I just believe that. I want you to look at that neighbor on your left and right. I don't care how long you've known him. I want you to look at him and say, do you need somebody to go to the altar with you? And if you lifted your hand or you should have, when they ask you that question, come out of your seat right now. Just ask your neighbor, do you need somebody to go? I'll go with you. Come on, this brother's already coming. Come on right here, pal. I see some people not asking. I'm gonna come ask. Come on, sweet girl. Come on, sweet girl. Come on. Come on home. Come on home. Come on home. Come on. Come on, that whole row's coming. My God, somebody shout in cookbook.
Jesus. They're still coming. Angels are clapping. Let the church give praise to God. Come on. It's not too late. Bring that whole row. Just come on, buddy. Come on. Bring grandma. Bring your cousins. Bring them all. Come on. I don't know if you know this or not. Revival is not coming. Revival's here. The door is open. Heaven is just invading. Somebody lift your hands and begin to praise God. Begin to thank Him for salvation. Stretch your hands toward this altar. Pastor, I'm going to ask you to help me get some prayer warriors just to come down and stand with these precious people that have moved. If you're a leader in this church, I want you to come help me. Just stand behind them for a moment. Just lay your hand on their shoulder. Let them know they're not alone. I want everyone that knows how to talk to God to stretch your hands toward this altar and ask God to touch every heart that's moved, every life that's come, every life that's come, every future that's being rewritten, every destiny that's being unlocked, every ounce of hope that he's pouring in. The condemnation is lifting. The guilt is gone. Free at last, free at last. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everyone that come to this altar, I want you to hear me. People are loving you and praying for you right now. And I'm not trying to give you some package prayer that will just alleviate your conscience. I just want to guide you toward the heart of God because sometimes we know God's touching us and convicting us. And I want to tell you this, you don't have to be a master of theology and you don't have, to, your theology doesn't have to be 100% correct to get born again. All you got to do is start this journey tonight by saying yes to Jesus. So I want every one of you that come to hear me right now, just lift your hands, close your eyes, forget about who's standing next to you, and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, come into my mind, sprinkle my conscience, clean my conscience up, get the dead stuff out of me and bring life in tonight. Come on. Forgive me of my sin. Every one of you that came, open your mouth. Don't listen to me. I'm not praying for you. I'm just giving you some direction on how to get, get in that place where God does what he wants to do. He already knows your heart. The Bible says in Romans, with a mouth confession is made unto salvation and with a heart man believes. You believe or you wouldn't have moved. Now just say, Lord Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Take control, take control, take control. Holy Spirit. Come on, just pray. 60 more seconds, church. Stretch your hands toward him and pray. God, save this young man tonight. Save this young man tonight. Save these precious sons of yours tonight. In the precious name of Jesus. In the precious name of Jesus. Come on, keep praying. Just a few more minutes. Holy Spirit, do the work. Jesus' blood, thank you for cleansing and for making us new. Rewrite their names, oh God. Rewrite their story. Rewrite their story. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Now I'm going to tell you how I feel led by the Spirit of God to pray tonight. I want every person in this room who's a part of this house, and if you came from another house, you can grab it tonight for your house, but I felt like God said, I'm going to give the bend a fresh baptism of the love of God because this city is about to get turned upside down, not with controversy, but with the love of God. I want you to lift your hand right now. I want you to say, God, burn in me. Burn in me, Holy Spirit. I'm praying now that you I need you to open your mouth and ask him for it. God, send a fresh baptism of agape. Send a fresh baptism of agape. Change us. Rework us. God, we pray you'll pull religious, religious spirits out of our atmosphere and let the love of God that transform us. Oh God, let it flow like a river across Cookville. God, we're not gonna compromise. We're not talking about getting soft on sin. We're just talking about opening up our heart to the goodness of God and the love of God that you gave us when we were saved. Change us tonight. Reach over, lay your hand on your neighbor's shoulder right now. Would you do it? 
Reach over, lay your hand on your neighbor's shoulder and pray this. God, fill him with a fiery love. Fill him with a fiery love. Let him love like you love. Let him love like you love, Lord. Oh, God, fill us with the love of your spirit. Dip our hearts deep into the love of God. I just heard the Lord whisper something to me that he said to me in prayer today and I'd forgotten. I wrote it down but I didn't read it because I didn't get to it but he just reminded me of it. He said, tell, t- he said, tell them that the move that they're hungry for is unlocked by the tears. church has lost her tears if I find five people in this room right now who say Lord just let my heart get touched again in that place of tenderness in your presence where I'm not afraid to let those tears I'm telling you there's a move of God coming in America and it, you're, we're going to weep one way or the other we'll either weep sorrow or we will weep because of the fiery presence of God burning in our heart I don't know about you but I pray this house I feel it in this room right now this house will weep as the power of God's love flows like a river so I just throw your hands up and say Lord give me back my tears give me back my tears give me back I'm tired of being callous I want to be tender again I want to be tender I want to be tender again there's a preacher in this room I don't know where And ministry's hurt. And I feel like this person has been hurt in ministry. God says your best days are not behind you. They're very much in your future. But he's going to give you your tears back, sir. you pray in the Holy Ghost for about 60 seconds right now just if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit will you pray in the Holy Ghost with me right now Oh, come on the Bible says in the book of Corinthians I will pray in the Spirit I will pray with understanding I will sing in the Spirit I will sing with understanding can you pray and sing in the Spirit of God right now come on something shattering and breaking I feel a stronghold even over this city being broken by this house tonight. There's a culture thing happening in this I declare in the name of Jesus that principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, all spiritual wickedness in high places comes into submission to the will of God and the will of God for this city is that it know the love of God and it will be known through the people of God and I pray this house come under a mighty baptism of that agape love that will shift the culture and will move the heart of God in this direction wash us of our frustration I'm going to my seat, but I want you to do this right now. Just as an outward sign, what are we getting rid of? Ready for this? Hatefulness just got off of all of us. Come on, tell somebody you look better now that hatefulness got off. Somebody tell me that. I'm telling you, God's filling us with love. It's about to transform a city. It's about to transform a city. High schools and middle schools. Somebody shout tonight. Pastor Shane is coming. I want you to lift your hands. Pastor Shane is coming. God, I thank you for the resident anointing that is powerful and in this house. I thank you for the deep well that is here. 
thank you for the testimonies. I thank you for that ancient wind that is blowing in this room. I feel it. I am asking you that that would blow the religious debris out of a city. And I call for the wind of the Spirit, the Ruach of God, to blow from the north, the south, the east, and the west, and blow on this house and this city so that every dead thing in this city can come to life. For the devil sees dry bones, but the prophet sees an army. Raise them up, God, and let the wind of the Spirit bring it together in Jesus' name. Now, as your pastor comes, put the highest, loudest, best, greatest shout unto God on the end of your tongue and let it out all over this house. Come on! ever heard a word from God in your life you heard it tonight everybody say let us we've, we've uh, long since should have moved on past this but we make spiritual warfare an individual thing but every spiritual warfare scripture in the Bible for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal for we wrestle not against every scripture in the Bible that deals with spiritual warfare is corporate in nature. And it's time that we come together. Because until we do, you can't defeat principalities and powers. And God never ordained presidents and politicians to pull down principalities and powers. That right is only given to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ so it's our time. Amen. I'm going to uh, let Pastor Kevin, would you give Pastor Kevin a wonderful thank you tonight? A wonderful thank you. I'm going to let him make his way back there so he can change clothes and get him something to eat. I want you to be seated for a second because we're going to do something very important. Tonight we're going to give a gift to Pastor Kevin and his ministry. Uh, our church has already written a significant honorarium check but tonight I want to give you an opportunity to give to him as well every person who preaches in this house we bless we bless and tonight what I want us to do is I want us how many believe you heard a word from God let me tell you something I've learned that if whenever you hear a word from God if you'll sow toward that word it'll do something for you and tonight, they're going to put the ways that you can give on the screen behind me. And uh, we want you to sow toward that word. And everything you give tonight, we're going to write another check and send it to Pastor Kevin and his ministry to do what God has called him to do. I'm so thankful that Pastor Kevin is not one of those prima donna preachers who told me I had to give a certain enormous amount of money to even get him to do a contract with me to come here when I told him we needed him in Cookville Tennessee he just said I'll be there I said I'll take care of you he said doesn't matter we'll be there and there's something special about that and so we as a church we always bless men and women of God who come here anybody who comes to this church will tell you that they get really blessed I am not one of those preachers that believes in just giving a thousand dollar gift to preachers we don't do that. We give extravagantly because you can't outgive God. Amen. And the language of kings is honor. The language of kings is honor. How many kings do I have in the house? Amen. So tonight, I want you to give. And those of you who are joining online, we want you to give as well. And we're going to make sure we send him a check. And we're going to bless him so good that he'll say, man, if nothing else, I got to go back there because they'll take care of me and bless them. I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed the last two days of just camp meeting, letting God do what God does. Amen. 
So the ushers are going to come right now. I'm going to pray over the offering. If you're making out a check, just make it out to the bend. We know that tonight's service is going to be uh, given to him, so we'll, we'll take care of that, and uh, you can trust us to do what we said that we'll do. Let's pray. Let's bless our giving tonight. Father, I thank you for every giver, every gift in this house. I pray, Lord, as they give tonight, you'd open the windows of heaven over their life and bless them. Lord, tonight we move by faith toward and into this word that we heard by giving, by giving, so that we believe we'll receive in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you as you give to the Lord. As you're giving to the Lord tonight, let me remind you, Sunday at 4 p.m. I almost said Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Sunday morning. Lord, help me, Jesus. Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m., we're going to throw down and have service again. And we're just going to turn loose and let God do what God's been doing over the last four or five weeks. It's just been amazing what God's been doing in this room. I'll be continuing teaching on some prophetic things and uh, how to win in the last days, how to win the war in the last days. We're called to be victors, not victims. We're the head and not the tail. We're above and not beneath. Amen? And so I want to teach you how to walk in that uh, this coming Sunday. So make sure that you're here. I want to remind you that the 28th, which is the next Sunday, Tony Suarez is going to be at our very special guest uh, here in the building with us. You've seen Tony on Flashpoint and everything else on television. He's been, been uh, out there a lot. Another great evangelist with a word from the Lord. And that's going to be on Sunday at our normal uh, service. So don't miss uh, that incredible meeting. We have stuff already lined up for May. You say, what are you doing? I'm trying to provoke you to draw close to the king amen and we're believing god to do some incredible supernatural things in that process stand up with me all over this room i want to say this before we leave i want to thank the worship team i want to thank the media team i want to thank every usher greeter parking lot person who has helped us all the hospitality people who set up food for these preachers and loved on them, I want to thank them tonight. I think you ought to say thank you to them. The children's workers, it's taken a lot of people just to make sure you're minister to. I also tonight want to uh, honor Pastor Greg Locke. Come up here, Pastor Greg. Come up here. I want to give him an opportunity to greet you. He came last night. He texted me this afternoon. He said, man, I feel like God wants me to be there tonight. And uh, it, I'm so honored to have Pastor Greg and uh, here with us and what God's doing down there in the Mount Juliet area uh, through him and through his ministry. Last night, those three rows that you saw were all preachers from our region that had come in because God is telling us not just to do something here, do something that'll reach our whole region for the gospel's sake. Amen. So there were preachers from all over this region that came in last night. There's preachers here tonight from various churches. And so we honor all of those wonderful men of God. Pastor Greg, tell them what God's doing. Tell them what you're seeing as you travel and then uh, just bless them and we'll be dismissed. Thank you, brother. You know, the Lord's been doing amazing things in our ministry as well. We've been, many of you know, in a tent for the last four years. I tell people much like you, we were mobile vision long before we were global vision because we had 15 locations in the first five years. And uh, we're still fighting lawsuits. But you know, the power of the Lord is doing something in Wilson County. And we're seeing people saved and baptized and set free and delivered and healed and I want to tell you one quick thing. I'm not here to preach. There's a reason God wanted me here the last couple nights. You know, five years ago, I would have been against every bit of this. I was the biggest cessationist in this room. Not just because I was a Baptist, but I was more Baptist than John the Baptist. I'm telling you, I was. And I mean, I was against all of it. And God embarrassed me out of bad theology. And started doing things in our church that I'd preached against for decades. I'd been preaching for 30 years before I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I didn't know what to do. I was scared. I thought I was going to have to read a note card. Shandala. I didn't know. No, when it happened, it happens. But here's why I was here tonight. And the Lord reminded me of this. 
See, yesterday was my 32nd spiritual birthday. I was saved 32 years ago yesterday. But I want to tell you why tonight's special to me. And I love this man of God, and I'm getting to know him so much better. We're going to have him down at our tent real soon. Y'all come down there with us and worship. About three years ago, I heard Bishop Wallace preach in person for the first time. I, I was coming out of cessationism. He talked about tears. I cry all the time. I barely even preach anymore. I cry. And I heard Bishop Wallace over at uh, the Crabs Church, Pastor Crab. And we had never met, but we knew each other because social media and going to some of the same conferences, we've always missed each other. He's not in here, but he, he did it, so he knows the story. My wife and I came forward. He said, I want every pastor, every preacher. And I, there must have been 60 of us in the room. They all started coming forward. He said, we're going to start laying hands. And he had preached that night on the, uh, the oil, Psalm 23. And he had oil on his hands. And he passed two or three people. And he came right over and he laid hands on me. He didn't know. Man, I'd been struggling for months with this giftedness and five-fold ministry. And he leaned down and he said, the Lord told me to tell you this is one of the first times I'd ever been just like privately, personally prophesied over. You have to understand, I didn't even believe in that stuff. And he leaned down and he said, up until now, it's been about your voice. But this year it'll be about your ear. And I knew what he meant. And a month later, deliverance hit our church and I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, for the last four years, the glory of God has fallen. And know this, as I travel the world, God's not doing it everywhere. He's doing it here. And I think you ought to rejoice that God saw fit that although he can dwell anywhere, he still desires to dwell somewhere. Amen. And I'm glad he's in Cookville, Tennessee. Amen. Listen, I love you. Get out of here. God bless you. Thank you for worshiping with us. I hope you leave on cloud nine tomorrow. Go tell the, the devil he can't have control of your life. You're in control and live like a victor tomorrow. God bless you. I'll see you Sunday.